Today we're going to do a quick test of four random kitchen gadgets that I picked up in Spain. So on my recent trip to Spain, I went to a big out of town Chinese imports superstore, sort of cookware and housewares hardware shop. And they had a really interesting kitchenware section and I am a bit of a sucker for utensils. So I found four things that I thought looked curious or interesting or different. And I thought we'd test them out today. So item number one is meatball pliers. I'll take them off the card. Most of the other items I think we're looking at today are made in China. This one I believe is made in Spain, stainless steel. And it's, it's a set of scissors for, with cups on the end for making meatballs, for making meatballs of very consistent size. So if you are a man from devices, perhaps this will prevent those nasty people making limericks about you. I'm sure that's what those limericks were about, meatballs. Anyway, construction seems a little bit kind of crude and flimsy, but I suppose these aren't going to be used all day, every day. If you were making meatballs in a restaurant, perhaps you'd need something a little bit more professional than this. This looks like it's kind of built for occasional use. It's made of steel that's been twisted and then welded on together. It says stainless steel. It kind of looks like maybe it might be nickel plated. That's item number one and that costs three euro sixty. Item number two is a little mold for small empanadas, empanadillas. So let's have a look at that one. This is made in China, two euros and it makes 10 centimeter empanadas so or empanadillas so you put your little circle of pastry on there you put your filling in close it up and it crimps for you and the empanada comes out the, out the bottom i presume you have to cut the pastry to the right size already or perhaps you can do that by crimping and then running a spoon across there or something like that so mini empanada mold seems fairly well built I think that's probably polypropylene plastic. Nicely engineered and closes nicely. Looks like it'll make an interesting crimp. Interestingly, not the crimp that we see on the pack shot, but there you go. Item number three is a slip-on silicone pour spout. This costs two euros. And this is really an accessory for any kind of bowl or pan that doesn't have a pour spout of its own. So made in China, and it is just a rubber spout with a curved thing be able to go on to, well, I imagine the diameter of the thing matters a little bit here. We'll take this to the kitchen and give it a try on various different pans and bowls and see how it performs. And finally, a giant pencil sharpener, which is actually a giant pencil sharpener. One euro fifty, and this is a kind of novelty item for, well, for cutting vegetables into thin strips. However, the diameter of this opening Makes me wonder. I suppose small cucumbers will fit in there. Carrots, slender sort of parsnips. Mostly, I think, I don't know that a courgette will fit in there. Maybe some of the smaller courgettes will fit in there. Oh, I see it's got a peeler on the bottom as well. So it's got a, a vegetable peeler there and this thing for slicing as well, which I won't run my fingers along because it might be really sharp. Construction, tiny little bit flimsy, but actually, do you know what? That might be quite a nice grip for a for one of these pivoting style razor peelers here. I'm not sure how long that's going to last because that blade is just set into two little dimples in the plastic. So that seems like the sort of thing that might not actually wear very well, but we'll give it a try. So I'll have to get some slender vegetables and then we'll give that a try slicing them into ribbons. And I suppose the ribbons can be used, well it shows them here being used for garnish, but I suppose if you've got a way of cutting vegetables into thin ribbons they can be lightly cooked and then used as a low carb alternative to pasta so that's my four gadgets now we're going to head to the kitchen and give them a try so on the way to the kitchen i was kind of wondering who really has the problem that this spout thing is trying to solve most of these vessels bowls pans whatever not that difficult to pour out of actually so i'm not really actually sure what the purpose of this device is but Let's test it out. So I have a feeling, even though it's got a little accommodation there for a rolled rim, that this is mostly for rimless bowls or pans with a small rim. I've got a feeling that it won't work very well on bowls like this. So I think we'll test that on there first. So yeah, that just, that just can't fit on that style of cooking bowl very easily. I, I don't know, maybe it can. 
OK, well, that seems to have seated OK on there. So let's fill that out with water and see if it pours. And I think what we'll do is we'll pour it into the next vessel that I'm going to test, which is this large nonstick pan. So here we go. OK, well, I'm pleasantly surprised by that. No dripping down the sides. That poured really cleanly. Um, quite like that, actually. That was interesting. So from this large pan, I think we'll pour into this small bowl, which again, I think might be a challenge for it because of the diameter. Anyway, let's try this one. So just make sure it's all seated down properly. So we're doing a fair test. Oh, you got some dripping. Now that's not working very well because, I don't know if you can see this, let's, let's get a closer view. In order to tip it far enough for the water to come over the spout, it's also going past the spout. So the water's coming round the side here and missing the spout altogether. So on a large pan like this, which is kind of what I thought this was for, not effective. Glad I chose to do this with just plain water rather than honey or spoiled milk. Okay, from this little bowl then with a thick rim. I don't even know that it's going to seat on there properly. You can see now I can get my finger underneath the edge of the spout there. So I think for this small bowl this is not going to well it's not going to get all of the contents out. So we're going to go from the small bowl into this larger bowl. Okay and that's working but I don't think it's going to pour the entire contents because some of it's gone behind the spout. But not bad, it didn't leak at least. Okay, from this bowl into this kind of medium sized saucepan. Now again we're getting leakage and I think it's the same reason. Yes, in order to tip it enough for the water to get over this lip here, some of the water will also divert around the edge of the spout. And there's no way of holding it to prevent that. So not ideal. So now we're going to go from this pan, which actually it seems to fit really well. So a straight sided thing. Oh, actually, I, well, I say it fits really well. I can get my fingers under the edge there. So from the medium sized pan into a larger pan. Kind of works, but we've got that problem again where the last little bit of liquid there is not leaving the pan because there's a gap behind the spout right there that liquid can't get out of. So the liquid's going behind the spout instead of on top of it. And I don't know what was quite so difficult about that anyway. Okay, and now from the large pan back into this bowl. not really working very well. I'm having to almost invert the pan to get the liquid out and again we've got a gap behind the plastic there so it's not working all that well. Just tipping it like that would be better. Well that's the testing over for this device. We'll come to conclusions later. Next up this pencil sharpener styled vegetable slicer. So the novelty aspect of this is probably the most appealing thing. I think it's quite funny that it's a large pencil sharpener and that's what drew my eye to it. About the only thing that's really going to work very well in here is carrots. Let's test out this peeler bit of it first. Yeah, well, that seems to work okay. I don't really get on with this style of peeler personally, but it's all right. Okay, well that bit works all right. And then I will just have to trim that bit off. Okay, and so okay, well, it makes carrot shavings that are reasonably decorative. I wonder if we can actually reconstitute that into something else. Let's just have a go. So if we just roll that up, can I make that into a kind of flower? Not that easily because it's all twisted. So. Well, kind of. So, yeah, carrot shavings, and well, it kind of gets to a point where it's not working all that well. 
and there's still a fair bit of carrot left. These would be good for garnish, but as I say, you can only really do that. Well, let's just try a few other things. So a more girthy carrot like this one just won't go in there because of the diameter of that opening. A courgette, and this is not a particularly big courgette, is not going to go in there. One of these green peppers, perhaps. Maybe without that end bit on there. Yeah, that kind of works. Feels a bit wrong. Again, we're getting to the point where, yeah, it just snaps. But yeah, we've got some green pepper shavings there for garnish. But most other vegetables aren't going to fit in there. Small sort of gherkin sized cucumbers might do. I suppose small pickles would as well. The problem I have with this is the amount of waste. You get to a point where, well, we've already got to that point. It won't deal with that anymore. So that much of the carrot is not usable. Of course, you could just slice it and use it, and I will. But you see the point. It doesn't really do very much. OK, time to test out these meatball tongs or meatball. Well, I called the meatball pliers earlier, but that was a mistranslation. I think they're actually called meatball tweezers, but meatball tongs seems about the most sensible way to describe them. So so this is not a recipe, but here's roughly what I'm doing. I'm going to make a kind of meatloaf style meatball today because the mince I've got, the mince beef I've got is 5% fat. So it will just need something else to carry it a little bit. So I've got some bread and onions in the food processor, which I'm just going to blend up first. I've got a bit of olive oil that's left over from my papas a la pobre. Dried sage, sweet paprika, a little bit of smoked paprika, a little bit of mace, a little bit of black pepper, about half a teaspoon of salt. Maybe about twice as much minced beef in volume as there is breadcrumbs. So about two thirds meat, one third breadcrumbs. So quite a little bit of bread, but there's a meatloaf style meatball is what I'm aiming for here. And again, so that's my meatball mix. Let's now try the tongs. And I guess the thing to do is you just, yeah, squeeze a chunk of the mixture until it's all like that. And in theory, we've got a meatball. Well, that worked pretty well. And it has kind of extruded out of the ends, but I suppose that's intentional to give you a consistent size meatball. There were two sizes of these tongs, and this is the slightly larger size. There wasn't a lot of difference in size, but I felt like the small one was maybe a little bit too small. So just so you can see how that works, I've got a big scoop of meat there, and it just kind of pulls it together, and then you scrape off the outside. So it's not keeping my hands completely clean here, Although I dare say you could do that with a small spatula if you really didn't want to touch the uh, contents. But that's the meatballs it makes. And they seem all right. And kind of unlike the meatballs I've rolled by hand in the past, it doesn't seem like they're going too tight. So I think when you roll meatballs by hand, sometimes you can end up with really dense meatballs. It seems like that's not happening here. No problem with them sticking to the tongs. Now I imagine this would be quite good if you've got a big family and you need to make a lot of meatballs fast and also you don't want people fighting over who's got the biggest one because they are all exactly the same. So as well as this we're just going to look at a slightly different method. Now I suppose there'll be a question about whether you can use these just to scoop meatballs directly out of the pack if you were going to season them after assembly. So if you're going to make just pure meatballs and season them on the outside only, which some people do. But yeah, that does work. But we're not going to make meatballs that way today. So I will just have to roll one by hand because that's the last one and it's not quite big enough. So verdict on the meatball tongs. They're really quick and they make very consistent meatballs, which looks good. We'll have a look at what those look like when they're cooked in just a moment. Not tremendously comfortable to use because these bits here are quite thin. I mean, and I've got quite a fat thumb. So that did actually get a little bit sore around here, but that might be me as much as anything else. And maybe I'm not meant to put my thumb all the way through there. Maybe I'm meant to just use it like that, like more like you'd use a pair of scissors. And I guess we'll just see how the meatballs come out. Although if that's a disaster, it might be as much about my recipe as it is about the tongs. They seem to function okay. So I'm just gonna fry those gently and keep on turning them onto sides that haven't been fried yet. You do tend to end up with meat polyhedra rather than meatballs. I don't 
really think that matters. A stick of celery, a carrot, a courgette and some mushrooms. How about that for knife skills? Got to try and remember, this was a video that's about the meatball tongs, not about how to cook meatballs and pasta. So I'm just going to taste one of these meatballs now, and then we'll go back to the review. So pretty happy with the way it makes meatballs, although I think, yeah, the meatballs I've made with these tongs, they have got flat sides where they were fried off because they've collapsed a little bit. Now that's, I guess, just a quirk of the recipe. You could make a firmer meatball mix and you'd get completely spherical meatballs. But do you want firmer meatballs? I suppose that's down to your preference. And I suppose the only thing that really needs to be tested with these meatball tongs is did the meatball stay together? Did it squeeze them together sufficiently to create a coherent meatball? And yes, it did. But I am just going to taste a bit now. Yeah, really good. It's time to test this empanada maker or empanadilla maker. I'm not going to go into massive detail about the filling, except it's going to use the rest of that minced beef, a whole bunch of vegetables and spices. Just going to make the filling first and then we'll test out the press. For the pastry for this, it's going to be a mixture of plain flour and strong bread flour to make 300 grams of flour in total. 150 grams of fat, which is going to be a mixture of lard and vegetable baking fat, because it's possible I might serve these to someone who's lactose intolerant in the family. So I can't use butter. Could have just used entirely lard, but that might make the pastry a bit brittle. A little pinch of salt, and I like to add about half a teaspoonful of smoked paprika to the dough. I've got sweet paprika in the filling. Smoked paprika will just give it a different little flavor dimension on the outside. And I'll just cut the fat into slightly smaller chunks before I start rubbing in. Use a sort of pulse setting on a food processor. You can rub in in a machine like that, or use a pastry blender like this one. But today, I think just for a bit of culinary therapy, I'm going to rub in by hand, so just kind of squeezing the flour into the fat, just gently with clean hands. If you've got cold hands, you'll be able to do this better than if you're a hot-handed person. Okay, and I think we're just about there now. Just going to make sure I get all the way down to the bottom to make sure there's no unmixed flour down there. Yep, so we've got kind of breadcrumb texture like that. Now normally with a short crust pastry you'd add a bit of water or milk to bring this together into a dough. Pedants and purists may wish to look away at this point because my favourite way to do this is ketchup for this particular kind of recipe. And ketchup will just add sufficient moisture for this to start to come together into a dough but also it will add a wonderful golden red colour and of course it's just made from tomatoes and sugar and vinegar so it will add those flavors into the dough. And that's probably enough. It doesn't look like enough, but as I stir this, you can see that's starting to come together into chunks. I'm just gonna squeeze that into a dough. Yeah, there we go, that's a ball of dough. So I'm gonna cover that and rest that in the fridge for half an hour, which is good because the filling still needs to cool down, but also this dough will improve and will gain a bit more structure as the starches and the gluten hydrate. Okay, pastry has rested. Let's make some empanadas. Now, of course, the device came with no instructions because I imagine most people who are making empanadas have been doing it a while and know what they're doing. So there's no prescription for how thick the pastry should be. So I'm just gonna use my own judgment on that and roll the pastry to 
about three millimeters thick and I'm gonna cut circles now I don't have a pastry cutter that's big enough for that but this cup measure is more or less big enough so I'm gonna try with that mm, get one more out of there and I will re-roll those scraps because it's short crust and it'll stand re-rolling once or twice so testing time I think that pastry might be a little bit thick so actually what I'm gonna do and this will compensate for the fact that my cutters are a little bit on the small side just gonna roll that a little bit thinner okay pastry on just fits it strikes me that an ice cream scoop might be the right size for measuring the filling so what I like here is the filling nestles down into a little hole and doesn't spill out I don't know whether it's absolutely necessary but I am gonna moisten the edges of the pastry and then oh dear that's not good filling can go back in the thing and despite the fact that looks a real mess I can re-roll that let's try that again just that much filling this time moisten around the edges and then carefully I didn't split this time crimp together and yeah that's nice and neat still looks a bit overfilled like that doesn't it you might well find that this is going to burst open when it's baked what we need to compare this to is a hand crimped one so let's just do one of those in fact I'll do one by hand and I'll do one crimped with a fork as well and then we can compare all three so there definitely is a bit more difficulty in getting the crimp nice and neat when you do it by hand and I am going to do a double crimp on this one like that make a very small double crimp it doesn't look particularly neat at the moment but I think it'll be okay when it's baked I'll need to do one more so this one I'm just pinched with my fingers and I'm going to go around with a fork and do that but that's dangerous because the fork does tend to push in there right okay there's too much filling in there I think that's the problem so I'm going to try this now with just a teaspoonful of filling because I think I probably have been overstuffing these except that just seems like such a small amount of filling mm. and it's torn there or it's missed or something let's just see if we can bodge that back together okay that one doesn't look quite so bad does it okay getting the hang of this now I think well I suppose yeah they are called empanadillas small empanadas so I shouldn't be too surprised that we are making the smallish version of the thing here I think I'm probably gonna make some bigger ones by hand so I think that's it for the mini ones so I've got the one the first one I made there which is thick pastry these are made with the thinner pastry that one's double crimped by hand that one's crimped with a fork so that's as far as I'm going to take it with these small ones so starting with about a quarter of the dough that's the other remaining quarter there I'm going to roll out just roll a circle rather than cutting a circle there's a kind of square cube law thing here going on the bigger you make them the more filling to pastry because the filling is increasing cubically the pastry is increasing on a square That seems a bit more the size I want to eat. Quick egg wash before these go in the oven. So yeah, I think these are gonna get three little steam vents and the slightly smaller ones will get two. And as far as I can tell, the mini ones are not supposed to have steam vents because the picture on the pack doesn't show that, although the picture on the pack clearly isn't made with this machine. 
Right, these have just come out of the oven. And actually, I think of all of them, the ones I think have come out best is the ones, the large ones that I crimped by hand, which is probably just down to the fact that I'm more familiar with this method of construction. This is how I normally would make a pasty. So that's probably why that worked best of all. So looking at the smaller ones, this is the one I crimped with the machine. That's the one I double crimped by hand. That's the one I crimped with a fork. These have cooled down because these were in the oven a bit less time. So the one I crimped with a fork kind of looks most like the empanadas that I would buy ready-made from a bakery in Spain. That one looks a bit messy. I think a double crimp at that scale doesn't really work very well. This is the one from the machine and it's very neat and tidy actually. What's happened is as the filling has expanded, in fact this happened with all of them, as the filling expanded it opened up that crimp a little bit and so we've got kind of a tidy edge in most cases. It worked really well except when it didn't. So there's one where it's opened up too much. And here's another one where the pastry just tore a little bit because of the way the crimp, because of the way the thing stretches it round. Again, probably down to practice, possibly down to the fact that my short crust pastry is very short. There's quite a lot of fat in here. If you made a less rich short crust pastry, it would have a bit more pliability and it might well take to this method a bit better. So that's the results. Now I think we need to head back to the studio, do the overview of these utensils and rate and rank them. I suppose before we do that, I should probably taste one of these, just so you can see what the inside looks like. I'll taste this misshape. Good. This pastry is incredibly delicate and light and crisp. The filling has nicely filled the little empanada and it's got a good flavor. Yep, I like that a lot. So time to pass judgment on these four utensils. And interestingly, the order in which I tested them is more or less their ranking, spoilers. But start with this slip-on pour spout. This is what I would call a solution in search of a problem. I'm not really sure what this actually does that's useful. It caused spillage in some cases, and in the cases where it did actually work, it probably wasn't any better than just pouring straight out of the container. It's almost like this angle here, this right angle spout, is just wrong. If that spout stuck out like that, perhaps, and maybe was drawn to a little point, that might have worked. But as it is, you get to the point where in a larger pan, you're tipping it so much to get the liquid over this edge here that it's starting to spill around these edges here. So not useful. If your experience of this product or something like it differs, do let me know in the comments. I can't actually see a use for that. I think that's pretty pointless. And like I say, I think that's a solution in search of a problem. The vegetable sharpener, not really all that useful. It's a novelty gift, I think. This is a gag gift, and that's probably the only value it really has. The peeler was okay, but not as good as other peelers of that type. The sharpener bit, well, it's very limited in what you can do with it. Whatever will fit into there might work, but you'll waste some of it. And even then, the shavings it produces are not really all that decorative. The meatball tongs, great idea, Slightly cheap implementation, I can't complain. The price was three euros 60, so you know, you get what you pay for. The tongs themselves are great and they function very well. And in fact, they close really nicely and they're well engineered at this end. This end, not that comfortable to use. They're just a little bit unfinished and harsh on the fingers at this end. I will definitely keep these though. I think they're usable and I think they're useful. And the empanadilla mold, I think that's probably really useful if you wanna make a lot of consistently shaped and sized little pasties, empanadillas, probably you could do pierogi in there and maybe gyoza type of things as well. You know, anything that's that kind of dumpling shape you could make in this mold. I think I just need a bit more practice with it and maybe need to refine the dough and look at different recipes for the dough and refine the amount of filling I'm putting in there because the temptation is to fill the whole of that cavity there but actually the reality is that will split the pastry. I don't think there's anything wrong with this and I think that's a very nicely engineered product. So I think probably ranking is as we tested them. So useless, funny gift, but useless, useful, but not that well engineered. Probably the best product of the lineup is this empanadilla mold. If you've got any suggestions for other products you think I should test, then do let me know in the comments. I'm particularly interested to know your guidance, your advice, your recipes for the dough and 
prescriptions for how to use this thing properly. This is the one I probably see myself using the most in the future. So I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.